where do brilliant original ideas come from? The kind that change the world. That make our hearts beat quicker and with excitement and the future seem a little less scary. It's one of those questions many of us wonder about when we can't sleep in the middle of the night and we feel so small as we float on a tiny piece of rock in a remote corner of an insignificant part of an infinite dark sky. Or as we stare out of the window on a long train journey, watching deer in the fields, exhausting themselves leaping a few miles, and we marvel at the way we have manipulated materials and their properties, and built them into an object that will carry us at remarkable speeds without moving a muscle. But the question of creativity, of how new things can take shape seemingly miraculously out of old ones, is so much more than idle speculation. It's a question whose answer we have to understand for the sake of our own future. Because whether it's climate change, food security, where artificial intelligence will take us, the potential for nuclear annihilation, or the implications of genetic modification and transhumanism, we face a future that could so easily go catastrophically wrong. And yet these issues are so complicated we have very little idea where to even start in tackling them, which is why we tend to call them wicked problems. The one thing we do know with some degree of confidence is that our current way of doing things probably isn't going to help us find good solutions. After all, those ways of thinking and acting are what got us into this pickle to start with. We know, in other words, that to help us solve our wicked problem pickle, we need creativity. And what I want to do is unlock some of the mystery of creativity so that every one of you here goes away with a slightly better chance of building a part of that future. First, I want to look at what some of the recent work in neuroscience tells us about creativity, about what happens when we come up with a new idea, and in what kind of brains that most commonly occurs. Then I want to explain a few techniques that can help your brain be more like that. And for that, I want to go a little further back in time, to some of the techniques developed centuries ago that turn out to be remarkably effective at making our brains better primed to be creative. The raw materials for creativity turn out to be incredibly simple. You need to know lots of things about lots of things. And you need to be able to use that knowledge to its full potential, which means being able to connect any one part of it to any other part of it. Some fascinating studies help us pin down these ingredients and offer suggestions as to how we might develop them. The world's leading expert on the neuroscience of creativity, Nancy Andreessen, has studied the brains of many of the world's most creative people. What her studies showed us is that resting brains have higher levels of activity in the association cortex areas of, those, of the brains of those um, who are more creative as opposed to those who are less creative. This ties in beautifully with a more recent study by a group of scientists in the Netherlands, which happened to contain leading memory athlete Boris Conrad, which looked at the effect of, on the brain of training using the techniques employed by memory athletes. And what they found is that this training led to similar activity in the resting brain as that that was associated with creative people. And this ties in with yet another study into what happens with the so-called aha moment. Um, these moments happen more often, the study found, among people who spent more time engaged in what we might call deep learning. So let's hold those things together and move to the second ingredient, um, connecting all that knowledge together. Another famous study carried out by the psychiatrist Charles Lim looked at what happened to rappers when they began to improvise. That is, when they started spontaneously generating ideas, the way we think of people engaged in creativity in generating ideas. And what Lim's MRI study found was that the moment people started freestyling, so they were put in an MRI scanner and told, right, start rapping, um, their frontal lobes, the part of the brain linked to self-censorship, shut down. Similar results were found in those other great improvisers, jazz musicians. So being creative is a combination of deep learning and being able to form connections. Or maybe we should say being able to turn off the mechanism that stops us exploring connections. So how do we make our brains more creative? Well, we start by learning lots of things about lots of things. But as these studies suggest, it matters how we learn. And I want to offer two techniques to help us learn in a way that makes it easier to do this. First, I want to talk about mind palaces. You probably come across the idea through Sherlock or Hannibal, 
Um, it's the technique that the memory athletes in the study we looked at earlier use. And it goes back thousands of years to Cicero and beyond. And in short, the technique is this. To remember a piece of information, we link it to something we already know. In fact, to something we know so well that it takes no effort to recall it, such as the route we take to work each day, or our home, or maybe the Bodleian Library. What we do for each piece of information is to find a sensual way of imagining it, usually a picture, which we make as memorable as possible by exaggerating it bringing other senses into play, making it humorous or rude. And then we attach it to, say, the statue of William Herbert, um, which will be familiar, I hope, to many of you. Um, so say I wanted to remember that, I'm a theologian, which will help you to understand this. Say I wanted to remember that the Council of Chalcedon was held in the year 451. Here's William Herbert, appropriately outside Bodleian's Divinity School. So what I do is I have a, add a vivid image of the Council of Chalcedon taking place. And to remember the year 451, I make the image burst into flames, reminding me of the book, Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> now, whenever I want to recall that piece of information, all I have to do is travel in my mind to Herbert's statue and discover what it was I left there. But although mind palaces are great, they aren't a magic bullet on their own. By their nature, they isolate things. They're about locations where things are stored. If we're going to be free to use our knowledge effectively, what we need, in essence, is a mind palace that has leaky plumbing. So once you've learned that something belongs in a certain place, it's very hard to shift in your head to, well, it might belong somewhere else, which is essentially what creativity is about. So we need to think about things in ways that mean that they could fit here, but they might also fit over there. Um, and to overcome this natural tendency to create shortcuts, specifically when it comes to how we think about things, instead of thinking about things in terms of a minimum kit, something that might help us to place things in a certain position, what we need is a maximum kit, something that makes it as easy as possible to move those things around in our minds. When we think of things, we need to get used to thinking about all of their properties, is what I want to suggest. All of their associations, personal, cultural, historical, as well as physical. These properties are, I like to think of as hooks, waving around, waiting to latch on to one another. And the more of these hooks you can set, the more connections you will be able to find as other objects. And to illustrate this, take the kind of te the question you might get asked in the standard creative thinking test. Um, and many of you will have been answering this kind of question with me up in the St Luke's Chapel this afternoon. Um, what would you get if you crossed a dog with a skyscraper? Our shortcut for identifying a dog might include, for example, being a four-legged furry mammal and so on, and likewise for the, um, the skyscraper. But when it comes to answering the question, that's, that's not very helpful. But if we maximise our dog definition kit, so it also includes the fact that dogs are known for their friendship of humans, for giving their Latin name variously to puncturing teeth, canines, and a group of islands, the canaries. Then you'll see what we start to get is some really interesting possibilities. So, for example, we might look at their strong reaction to baths. What might, how might that link to the fact that we, it's hard to clean the windows in a skyscraper? It loves chomping bones, whereas skyscrapers have people inside, so you can imagine skyscrapers as these carnivorous beings marching over cities, crunching everything in their wake. Um, so, now we know all this stuff, how do we train our brains to turn off the self-sensor mechanism so we can connect things more easily? And that's what brings me to, to mycelium, which is what some of you have been playing with me up in St Luke's Chapel tonight. Um, and here's how it works. You have two decks of cards, and from the first one you draw one of 16 challenging ways of connecting objects. Some of you have, have answered questions like this with me tonight. Um, after the zombie apocalypse, you can choose to say blank or blank. Um, and then you, you fill in the gaps with, for example, an oil well and a violin. 
Um, and so you get a question. After the zombie apocalypse, you can choose to save an oil well or a violin. Explain your choice. Um, it's actually it's a question I ask to every group I do this with. And you get some fascinating answers that tell you a lot about people's psychology and whether they value the economy or whether they value culture. Um, and it's not always the way that you would imagine. Um, it's an incredible the amount of people who think that a violin will provide you with some way of forming a new economic system, um, whereas an oil well produces the plastics that might enable you to create a whole new set of cultural um, fabulousnesses. Um, <laughs> and scoring the game is very simple. The more people who come up with an idea, the fewer points that idea scores. So what you're doing is you're basically delivering a dopamine hit every time someone comes up with an outrageous idea in the hope that the brain will eventually find it increasingly easier to make those truly original connections. Um, and so to end, um, this is pretty much the last thing of the evening, isn't it? You know more Lindy Hop. Um, have you, have, is it in here that the Lindy Hop was happening? Oh, I was going to say that would be interesting with all these desks. Um, I want to end with something that ties all these things together. Um, when it comes to the kind of deep learning techniques that we've discussed briefly here, one thing on which there is widespread agreement is that there is one prerequisite that beats all others when it comes to the ability to learn in a way that primes your brain to be creative. You have to love what you learn. I'm very lucky in that I've always loved learning anything. Um, I've also been stubborn enough to forget what I was told um, and just learn what I felt like. Um, so when I came for my Oxford interview, um, I was being interviewed for classics. I spent the whole half hour um, talking about the genetics of racehorses. And um, for some reason, they still let me in. Um, and uh, yes, 29 years, I'm still later, I'm still here. Um, the great thing is, when it comes to creativity, it really doesn't matter what you learn, whatever you're told. It just matters how you learn it. In short, and I suppose it comes down to this, the more fun you have learning stuff, the better place you'll be to come up with the ideas that will make the world a better place.